About a month ago, I got the strangest text in my entire marriage from my wife. I was actually in Israel, in a Jerusalem hotel in the beginning of March, and my wife wrote me these words. I want to read them to you verbatim. You may think I'm crazy, but I'm serious about this. Take any toilet paper you can. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I remember reading that in Israel thinking, what, what is happening in America? <laughs> is the zombie apocalypse or the, the walking dead come to life? But now, because of the coronavirus, you, you totally get her text. Um, the day she sent that to me was the day that President Trump made the announcement of the European travel ban. And if you recall, on that day, everything snowballed so quickly. In an instant, our country changed, our lives changed, the world changed, the economy changed, school changed, everything changed. And I wonder, in the midst of all those changes, you have had to deal with more than just a little bit of fear. Now, I googled the dictionary definition of fear. Fear is the negative emotion that you might be separated from something you want. And the coronavirus, in so many ways, has threatened or actually separated us from the good life that we used to have. I know some of you right now are dealing with physical fears. You're afraid that you're going to be infected, that someone that you meet at the grocery store is an unknowing carrier of the virus, that you're going to start coughing one day. We're afraid of pre-existing conditions in our elderly parents. We're afraid there aren't enough hospital beds or ventilators or masks. We're physically afraid that the curve might not flatten in time and that someone we know and love might get sick. Some of us are afraid emotionally. Just the, the depression of all the negative news. The anxiety of being stuck in our house with all the same people. Members of my church have texted me saying, Pastor, you've got to pray. I, I can't do this. And maybe you're afraid this is going to keep going. Or maybe your fears are financial. A stimulus check is great and government help can help. But still, some of us have lost our jobs. We've lost our hours. The job market's going to be so different when all of this ends. The government is dishing out money, but what's going to happen in the long term? I know business owners who've dropped 60, 75%. My own family income has dipped by about 18% and, and maybe you're afraid of what it's going to happen as this year goes by. Or maybe your fears are spiritual. You know that you should trust God and that you should love people. But in the midst of all this, you're afraid that you, you can't. Maybe you should trust God but you're alone and it, it's getting to you. How can you be a good God who lets you go through this and makes you feel so lonely? Or how can you love these people, these people you can't get away from? You see them every single day. You're working in this cramped environment. The, the kids are wearing on each other. You've baked a thousand meals. You've washed a thousand loads of laundry. You just, you can't, you can't love like God calls you to love. So for all these reasons and a million more, the coronavirus has surfaced so many of our fears and separated us from the life that we used to have, the life that we want to have. But that's why I'm so thankful for Easter. If you know the original story of Easter, think back 2,000 years, what was happening? Were people gathered in joyous celebration? No. They were afraid. Afraid that they lost Jesus? Afraid of what the government would do? Afraid of the authorities in the corrupted church? <laughs> the Bible says the disciples were hidden behind locked doors out of fear. They were isolated, quarantined, and, and yet what was the message of Easter? Do not be afraid. In fact, in Matthew 28, God sent an angel to a couple of faithful female disciples and the angel said, verse 5, Do not be afraid. And then just a few verses later in verse 10, Jesus came to those same women and said, Do not be afraid. The message of Easter is that if there is a God, and if that God loved us enough to send his own son, and if that son gave up his life on the cross and then came back from the dead, 
we don't have to be afraid. The world might be messed up, the government might be backwards, the church might be corrupted, but if we have a Jesus who is alive, there is no reason to be afraid. And so this week, I want to unpack with you the Easter story. Now, I want to show you layer by layer why Easter allows us to live this year, this crazy corona year, without fear. So if you're physically afraid, emotionally afraid, mentally afraid, financially afraid, spiritually afraid, whatever kind of afraid, I hope you can come back and meet the living Jesus who says, don't be afraid. I'm here. God is here. There's no reason for fear. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, I'm talking to you right now. We're praying to you right now because you're not dead. (laughs) You were, but now you are alive. The glorious God who knows all about corona and controls every last bit of it, you're with us and you are for us. And that's why we are not afraid. I pray for everyone who is praying right now, who's dealing with some kind of fear that they just can't get past. That fear might not shrink, but I pray in the days to come, we would remind ourselves how great and glorious you are and realize that with you, we don't have to be afraid. God, let that happen in our hearts. Let our fear disappear. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I know I shouldn't be critical with the Bible, but the other day I was. I was preparing for the big Easter sermon, reading Matthew 28, and something bothered me about Matthew's account. It's how much he talked about the Romans and how little he talked about Jesus. Let me show you what bothered me. Here in this Bible, this is the last full page of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 28. And in Matthew chapter 27, he spends this whole chunk talking about the Romans. Then he spends this section talking about the Romans. And he spends this whole section talking about the Romans. And I wanted to say to Matthew, hey, it's Easter. (laughs) Maybe you should talk a little bit more about, um, I don't know, Jesus. But then God helped me realize why my criticism wasn't valid and that maybe Matthew kind of knew what he was doing. Because here's what I realized. Back in the first century, for the original readers of Matthew's Gospel, what was their biggest fear in the world? The Romans. You know, these days we're pretty terrified of the corona pandemic, about infections and the curve that just won't flatten about cases getting closer and closer to home. We're worried about all the what-ifs, the domino effects. How is this going to change our world? But people 2,000 years ago weren't afraid of corona. They were afraid of the Romans. It was the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, that killed Jesus. It was the brutal Roman guards who had pounded the nails through Jesus' flesh. It was the Roman Empire that were still roaming the streets of Jerusalem where those early Christians lived. And I think that's why Matthew talks so much about the Romans. I love this little line here. Uh, The angel shows up and it says, The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. (laughs) Can you imagine being a first century Christian and reading those words? We're so afraid of the Romans, but then God sent one angel. (laughs) And when the armed Romans, the black ops of the ancient world, saw not glorious Jesus and not the whole army of angels, just one angel, they shook in fear. Oh, and I love that fact. It's like, here's us. Here's our greatest fear. But just one angel proves that we have nothing to be afraid of. Because if just one angel is that glorious and strong, imagine the God who created him. Imagine the God who is so strong and mighty and glorious and good that the whole army of angels bows their knee and worships him. Well, if that God was our God, then we would have no reason to be afraid. So, let me ask you today, what's your greatest fear? In the middle of this pandemic, what do you worry about the most? Is it the duration of corona? You know, what started as this novelty in the early days or weeks is now stretching into months and into a quarter. What what if this goes through the summer? 
All that change weddings and concerts, family reunions and celebrations. What if there's a, a funeral in the family? What if the sports get canceled? What if the family is all cooped up for months and months and months to come? What then? That, that fear sounds big. And it would be big if God wasn't bigger. If just one of his angels wasn't bigger than that fear, we would be afraid. But Easter morning proves that we have nothing to fear. That the God who is running the show, he would make your greatest fears shake like those Roman guards. And so today, maybe joy isn't getting into your heart. Maybe that fear and worry and concern is like a guard that you just can't get past. Well, today I want you to confront that fear with God. With the eternal, glorious, exalted, magnified, good, bigger than you thought, leave the caps lock on, God, let him confront your fear. The God who knows, the God who cares, the God who can, the God who controls, the God who loves, the God who persists, the God who endures, if that God actually is God, and he is, you have no reason to be afraid. Let that single angel from Easter morning kick the guard out of your heart and let joy and peace come flooding in. We can't change Corona, but we can exalt the name of Jesus Christ. And once we do, we'll have no reason to fear. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Jesus, thank you, not just for being alive, but for being better than we imagined. Uh, we can't see you, so it's easy to think less of you, but the angels of heaven, these glorious angels, they bow their knee and worship you. So the fact that you're with us, that you love us, that you control our future, that you're for us, that's what deals with our fear. I pray today, Heavenly Father, for those especially who have tender hearts. For my brothers and sisters who are prone to worry and what-if situations. Often they're thoughtful and compassionate and empathetic, but this can be the downside of that love. So Heavenly Father, help them. Dispel their fears, open their eyes to your presence and your glory. So like the women on Easter morning, we are reminded that we don't have to be afraid because we have you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for being with us. And I pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. I know that Corona is still here, but you still don't need to fear because Jesus isn't there. <laughs> That's my cheesy, not quite rhyme for you today. But Jesus isn't in the tomb and that's why we don't have to be afraid. And you can trust me because I actually checked. Just before this past Easter, I had the incredible blessing of being in Israel. And one of the crazy things about being in Israel during the whole coronavirus is that no one else was in Israel. <laughs> There are obviously billions of Christians on planet Earth and many, many of them like to travel to Israel to see the spots where Jesus was born, where he walked on water, where he died on the cross, where he was risen from the dead. So sometimes in Israel, the tour buses stack up one after another and the people stand in line just for a few seconds at some sacred spot. But this time, uh, this time it was different. And that kind of worked out for me. <laughs> I actually got to go to the two places where scholars speculate that Jesus might have been buried. The Garden Tomb and the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Now, normally at both places you have to wait in line. You have just your few seconds that you try to make very spiritual, but then you get rushed out so the next person can come in. But this time I got to look around. I got to linger. I got to investigate. We actually had a whole hour and a half of private time to film an Easter message at the Garden Tomb. So I got to look inside with no one rushing me and the clock not ticking. And Jesus wasn't there. Later that same day, we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the, the place where I think it happened. And I just couldn't believe how empty it was. There were no lines. I got to look around and see and search. And guess what I found? No Jesus. And obviously, that's not the only proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it reminded me why Easter is so good. Because we don't just have a Jesus who sacrificially died for our sins. We have a Jesus who rose from the dead so that he could be with us. 
I think of Matthew chapter 28. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. To take away the fear, the angel said to the women, Come and see the spot. He's not here. Because the Jesus you love, the Jesus who was crucified because he loved you, he's not here. He's alive. Friends, that's such good news. You don't just have the forgiveness of sins. In the middle of the coronavirus, you have a God who is with you, a God who knows you, a God who is at your side. You might feel kind of lonely as a widow, a single person, self-isolation in your nursing home, in your apartment, but you're actually not alone. Glorious Jesus, risen from the dead, has promised, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And maybe you're not alone. Maybe you wish you were. (laughs) Maybe your significant other is getting on your nerves. Maybe the kids are driving you nuts and you just don't feel like you can. You're afraid you're going to snap. But if Jesus is alive, he's with you too. When you duck off into the bathroom because you just need a little bit of quiet space, you, you pray to him and he's not far away. He's there. Or when you go out to the driveway for some fresh air, It's Jesus who is present with you in that place. The Jesus who can send his spirit to give you strength to love those people even when they don't deserve it. And so what the angel said is so true. Don't don't be afraid. Don't be afraid that you can't. Jesus is alive, so you can. He's risen and I saw the place where he isn't. So don't be afraid, even if Corona is here, because Jesus, your Savior, is not there. He's right there with you. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Holy Spirit, we need your help. Give us the eyes of faith that we could see that there is a Jesus who can do anything and he is with us everywhere. Help us to see him, to envision him, to, to picture him so that whatever we're facing today, it seems so small by comparison. We know that you can and we know that you want to. So hallowed be the name of Jesus today. May your will be done in our hearts. I ask this because of him. Amen. Do you ever wonder if you're worthy? We all have different struggles in the Christian church, but I know there's a certain group of people who pretty frequently wonder if they're worthy of God's love. I can think of a guy who so often thinks of his own failings and sins and struggles and weaknesses. And I I know that he believes in Jesus, but he just so frequently questions, does does God love me? Does he forgive me? Am am I worthy? I just had a conversation yesterday with a a guy about my age who had this memory of of being just a boy and wondering, am I I really forgiven? Am I worthy? I, I could think of at least two, if not three people who almost every week reach out to me with tears in their eyes and they question if what Jesus did on the cross was for them. Are they forgiven after all their struggles, after the things they still struggle with? Is, is grace theirs too? And I have a bunch, there are a lot of you out there who feel the same way. It's a very broad brush, but sometimes in the church there are these really intellectual people who don't have the biggest hearts. They say, the Bible says it. I believe it. I know I'm forgiven. End of story. There's another whole group of people who are known for compassion and empathy, for selflessness and service, whose hearts are so big that oftentimes their hearts trick them. Their feelings and emotions are so strong that they ask that question, am I worthy? And maybe you're one of those people or maybe you love a person like that. If so, I want to tell you this little detail from the story of Easter morning that you might have missed. Here's what it says. Suddenly, Jesus met the women. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. You know what word you you might have missed if you've read that story before? Them. Do you know who the them refers to? 
a group of women, one of whose name we know, Mary Magdalene. Do you know the amazing story of Mary Magdalene? Mary Magdalene's name shows up 13 times in the New Testament. Twelve of those times happened during this last weekend of Jesus' life. She's at the cross. She sees him being buried. She's there when he rises from the dead. Twelve times. But the other time, the thirteenth time, comes in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, where we learn that Mary was once possessed by seven demons. My family and I have been watching the biblical miniseries called The Chosen. Have you heard of it? The very first episode depicts what Mary's life must have been like before Jesus. What a dark and disturbing, can you imagine being possessed by a demon, by by seven demons? And yet what happens on Easter morning? The first person to hear the good news, the first person to touch Jesus risen from the dead, The first person to hear, first from an angel and then from the very Son of God, you don't have to be afraid. Who is it? It's Mary. The woman with the most disturbing history. The darkest stuff in her closet, she was the closest to Jesus. I don't think that's an accident. I think God set that up so that all of us who wonder if we're worthy, if our past is too messy, if we've messed up too much, too often, that we would hear Jesus speaking to us, don't be afraid. And when we reach out to him for forgiveness, when we hold onto his feet like Mary, he doesn't shake us off. Instead, he says, don't be afraid. Easter morning gives us good news of Jesus, crucified and risen, not just for other people, but for the people at the bottom, the people who feel like they're the worst, those of us who wonder if we're worthy. In fact, can, can you imagine having a conversation with Mary and telling her about your sins? But, but Mary, I, I messed up my family. Could God love me? But Mary, I, I've struggled with drinking. I, I laugh at inappropriate jokes. I can be really critical and mean. The words that come out of my mouth, do you think God could love me? <laughs> what do you think Mary would say? I was possessed <laughs> by seven demons. But yeah, he still loved me. I saw it in his eyes. I heard it in his words. And if he can love me, a possessed woman, he absolutely loves you. Easter morning is not just beautiful and historical. It's powerfully emotional. It tells us that by the blood of Jesus, his death and empty tomb, we have been made worthy in the sight of God. So don't be afraid. The glorious Jesus conquered your sin. He conquered your shame so that you could be worthy and you could worship him forever and ever and ever. That's the good news of Jesus. And it's good news for you. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you for being the friend of sinners. Thank you for choosing a loudmouth like Peter and competitive people like John, doubters like Thomas and messed up sinners like Mary. It reminds us that you're in the business of loving people who don't deserve it and you love us too. I pray for every brother and sister with a tender heart, those who frequently wonder if their faith is enough. Remind them today that you are enough and that with the faith of a mustard seed, the tiniest little bit of faith, you save. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for your grace that reaches to the bottom. We worship you today for it and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Way back in 1527, Martin Luther was not afraid of the pandemic. If you know a little bit of the history, the bubonic plague was sweeping through Germany, devastating the planet, way worse than anything Corona has currently done. And people flipped. When Martin Luther, the German pastor and university professor, wrote to one of his friends, he he said, I have never seen such an unimaginable work of Satan. His students scattered. They ran in fear. People kept their distance from one another. But was Martin Luther afraid? Did he run? Nope. And in just one second, I want to tell you why. 
But first, I want to tell you a detail from the Easter story that many people miss, connected to a truth that even today many modern Christians miss. Here's the story from Matthew 28. The angel had appeared to Mary Magdalene, told her, Jesus is risen, go to Galilee and you'll see him. And we read these words. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. (laughs) They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Oh, I love that detail. The women thought they had to wait. It was good news. They were going to see Jesus, but first they had to travel all the way north to Galilee, and and then they would be with him. But suddenly, (laughs) Jesus showed up early. And he still does that. I meet so many Christians who talk about Jesus' presence like something that's only for the future. You know, when I die, I have faith, I know that I'm saved, I'll get to be with Jesus. But did you know that Jesus shows up early? Do you know that Jesus made a promise to be present even now? Do you know that through faith, eternal life isn't a gift for your future, but a gift for this very day? We aren't born to life on our birthday and born to eternal life on our death day. No, the moment you first believe, suddenly eternal life begins and Jesus is there. And that is why Martin Luther was not afraid. He wrote to his friends these words, Yet I am staying here, and that is necessary because the people are terribly afraid, but Christ is here too, and therefore, We are not alone. Christ is here, Luther believed. Not he will be here when I die, but right now, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all these people who are so afraid, he's right here with me and we are not alone. And I want to remind you of that fact too. This past Easter might have been the most authentic and original Easter we have ever had. We are so used to 2,000 years of traditions, to big church buildings, little girls in Easter dresses, little boys eating too many sausage links and donuts at the Easter breakfast. We're used to the hymns, the organ, the the band, the, the preaching, the celebration, but that's not how the original Easter was. The original Easter was just a couple of women and Jesus. And it brought them such joy. Because they didn't have to wait till Galilee. He showed up early. And he still does. You don't have to wait to heaven. In fact, you don't have to wait till the end of this isolation. Right now, you can hold on to Jesus. And you don't have to be afraid. If your faith in him, he's with you. God is here. And that is how you deal with your fear. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, I, I love you for being right here, right now. I think of how happy I would be if all of my friends were in this space right next to me. I think of what a surprising joy it would be if the door swung open and the church flooded into this place. That would make me feel so good. And yet, that's nothing compared to you. And you are here. I see you right now by faith. You you sit next to me and you are with all of your people at the same time. And I thank you for that promise. I thank you that while we wait for heaven, we don't have to wait for you because you're with us even now. Give us peace as we ponder that fact. Help us to push away our fear and to let our light shine so brightly for those around us who desperately need it. I pray this, Jesus, because you're right here. And I pray in your name. Amen. Hey, friends. You may or may not know that Time of Grace Ministries is 100% donor-supported. You know what that means. We wouldn't be here without you. At all. Thank you. We're so grateful for the ways that you allow us to encourage others with the word of God and if God would move you in your heart to be able to, or to do that again, we'd, uh, we'd be so grateful. Click on the link below and you'll find more opportunities to support the ministry. Hey, what's up everyone? Pastor Mike here from Time of Grace. Thanks so much for checking out this podcast. Uh, we certainly would love this message to reach more and more people. So if you wouldn't mind rating and reviewing this podcast, it would bring it to more people's eyes. 
And we pray this message into more people's hearts. Thanks for your support, and we'll talk to you soon.